Greetings, dear listeners. This is Jonah Goldberg, host of the Remnant Podcast, brought to you by the Dispatch and Dispatch Media. Um, we've had quite a string of episodes of late um, with a lot of talk about social issues in America and uh, political theory. And I feel like we have left out a really important country that begins with I. And I know all of you are thinking I'm talking about Israel, but you're wrong. I'm talking about India. Um, I've wanted to do an episode about India for a while. Uh, U.S.-American relations with India. What does the intelligent American need to know about India? Um, I've gotten a lot of emails from listeners saying, how come you never talk about India? Um, I have relatives who are Indian. I have close friends who are Indian, Indian-American, I should say. Um, and I've never done it. And I'm so sick of the punditry stuff that I figured uh, I was at a conference recently and I saw my AEI colleague, Sanan Dume doing a panel. The rest of the thing was off the record, so I can't really talk about it. But it was it was really interesting, and it reminded me, made me feel guilty that I've never had him on, and I've never done this podcast. So I'm going to kill two birds with one stone and have my colleague, um, who he insists I've been pronouncing his name correctly. I'm a little skeptical, but it's Sadanand Dume. Uh, he's a senior fellow at AEI. His research areas are India and Pakistan, Southeast, South Asian political economy, South blah, 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 all those things. Um, he has a, he's a columnist for the wall street journal about all of the above. He, uh, was a foreign correspondent for the far Eastern economic review. He writes about all of these things, uh, brilliantly and pellucidly, uh, Sadanan, welcome to the remnant. It's great to be here. Thank you. Let's say you're stuck on a flight sitting next to someone like me and he finds out that you're a think tanker and a columnist who writes about. Indian and South Asian affairs, and you're stuck having to be polite answering questions for a little while, because that's basically the situation that you're in. For 50 years, they've been talking about how Brazil is going to be the next big thing. Um, and now it seems to have switched that India is the next big thing. How is India doing? Well, that really, that really, this has to be like a United flight or something that takes five <laughs> hours to take off, to take off the ground. Uh, but, but answer it as you see fit. I mean, you're right. I mean, there, there, it's a, it's a bit of the, you know, flavor of the month or a flavor of the year. Uh, last year, India became the world's most populous nation. This is for the first time since the middle of the 18th century, which is kind of staggering if you think about it, right? Like when, when we were in, 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 in school and we learned what was the world's most populous country, we all learned China. But that's a little factoid that was true of our parents and our grandparents and our great grandparents. And you can go back all the way to about the 1750s. And now India has overtaken China. It has become the world's most populous nation. Uh, its economy is growing fairly fast, above 6%. If you look at quarterly rates, it's been above 7%. Narendra Modi is the prime minister. He's been in power for 10 years. India is heading into a general election. Modi is likely to come back. So there's an element of political stability. And of course, every time India has an election, it's the largest election in human history because, you know, this time there are, there are 970 million voters. Five years ago, there were 900 million voters, out of which 600 million actually showed up and voted. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's a lot there's a lot going on. Like Apple is making phones in India. And there's a general, there's a kind of, you know, what I call the India hype industry. And that is, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the investment banks in, in particular, but also a, a lot of the business press. And of course, in India itself, it's almost like a mantra that, you know, this is India's time. India's time has come. Uh, everything is going well. India is going to be the next superpower and so on. So if I had to kind of, you know, summarize my response, I'd say that, well, look, it's undeniable that things are better in many respects than they were when I grew up in India. So, for example, a few months ago, I was in Bangalore to see my parents and I went, Bangalore has a new airport terminal. T3 terminal. It's called T3. It's an it's a beautiful terminal. Um, it's as beautiful as you know anything you'd see in you know Singapore or Amsterdam, uh, and uh, that would have been unimaginable, for example, uh, in, in, uh, you know in India in the 1960s or 1970s or, or even even 1980s. So some things are better. Uh, the roads in many parts of the country are are much better. There is a sense of optimism. It's a very young country. The median age is around 28. Uh, so you, you, so I can understand why there's this uh, sense of optimism. But if you look at it a little bit more closely, I mean, you're absolutely right. Um, we've heard this story before. 
And if you look at the raw numbers, um, India remains, uh, you know, first and foremost, a very poor place. Uh, the per capita income in in India is uh, around, you know, twenty eight hundred dollars. Uh, it's basically it's 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 not just poor compared to the United States, but it's very poor compared to China. In China, it's more than thirteen thousand dollars. So uh, it remains a very poor country. It has uh, many, many. I mean, the, the kinds of problems that India has make you know the problems in the U.S. look like you know look like a like a picnic in comparison, uh, including like you know massive inequality, uh, you know a, a layer of highly educated people who are thriving, but also the world's largest cohort of of illiterates. And you have all this in a democratic system that is facing a lot of strains, not in the sense of being an electoral democracy, and maybe we can get into this more a little bit later. You know, Indians go out, they vote, they vote in large numbers. Um, They're very proud of that, and they choose their own government. And all that is great. Uh, But if you look at things like, you know, the, the freedom of the media, the health of independent institutions like the courts, the supposedly independent, uh, nonpartisan bureaucracy, um, all those are, 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 are coming under strain. So uh, even though the, you know, the world's view at this moment in time is overwhelmingly glass half full, uh, with India, I think it's always possible to make the opposite argument too. And I think that there's still a lot of merit in taking a glass half empty view. Yeah, so I, I, it's funny you put it that way, because I, I think Every large complex phenomena is large enough. It's like, it's like the law of large numbers. It's large enough to find evidence for almost every thesis and the opposite, right? Like I can, in popular culture, I can give you, particularly because as a journalist, all you need is three examples to equal a trend. So I can, I can come up with all sorts of things in pop culture to say we're becoming more moral, more traditional, more reserved. Uh, in popular culture as evidenced by popular culture. And I can give you three examples of how we're becoming more licentious and decadent because both things are true, right? And it just, it's too big a thing to say all the arrows point in the same direction. Um, and I think, but, but, the, but the difference, Jonah, is that I think in India, the three examples you can pick mm-hmm. are just pretty, are, are probably starker than the examples you can find in most places, right? So for in India, for for example, you could say that, well, Bombay now has uh, more billionaires than Shanghai. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you also have, you know, the world's largest number of people who ha- can't read their name. Yeah, yeah. It's just like, it's the, it's, it's, it's the, the, the contrast. I mean, sure, you can sort of say things, right? You know, is, is Germany doing well or is Germany not doing well? But I think you can make certain broad assumptions about many advanced industrialized countries that are, you know, they're, they're not, the, the, the very heart of the thesis is not up for debate. No one is arguing about, you know, well, is, is Germany a prosperous country? Uh, has it successfully industrialized? And I think in India's case, because there tends to be, you know, so much of the, our conversation about India tends not to be about India in 2024, but it tends to be about our idea of what India will be in, say, 15 years or 20 years. And I think Americans by nature are optimistic. Uh, a lot of Americans want India to do really well. And so there's just a sort of tendency to, you know, to, 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 to focus on that. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a good point. I mean, I hadn't really thought about that. The, the delta between the best case for Germany right now and the worst case for Germany is pretty constrained. Whereas, you know, <laughs> more billionaires than, than Shanghai versus the most illiterate people, that's a bigger spread, you know, statistically. So on the question of Modi, he sort of seems to me this, this whole point in microcosm insofar as I've talked to people who say he's, you know, the modernizer, he's fantastic. Um, he's, he's, taking India in the 21st century. And I've met people who say he's, you know, uh, a couple shades shy of being a strong man. And um, is there, first of all, where do you come down on that? And second of all, I know historical analogies are always perilous, but is he, is he more like Bismarck or Ataturk or Frederick the Great or, uh, MBS. I mean, like, who who would you compare him to? 
in terms of the work he's doing and how he seizes his own role in, in running such a giant country? Well, that's a terrific question, right? And I think, you know, you have all these figures around the world. I think, I think we, you know, we live in a moment where it's almost like hard to have reasonable discussions about so many world leaders, right? Like, like, like Bukele in El Salvador or, or Javier Millet. Or obviously, I mean, tr- Trump is a great example, right? Um, you know, we just these are these are these are politicians who evoke very powerful emotions. And in the Indian case, you've almost seen you know politics in India be transformed into this sort of this 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 single question: Is this someone pro Modi or anti Modi? Right. So, but that's and and what I what I I, I just try to be dispassionate to the extent uh, possible. Um, I'll, and I'll get to the analogy because I spent you know quite a bit of time thinking about that. But just a little bit of a you know a sketch for some of your listeners who you know may not be in the weeds of Indian politics. So Modi is uh, seventy three years old now. He's been in power. He's been prime minister of India since two thousand and fourteen, and it's a remarkable political story because this is a person who did not come from any kind of privilege. He was not born into the country's English speaking elites. He was not born in either Delhi or Mumbai, which used to be called Bombay. He was uh, uh, just a grassroots organizer with the with the Hindu nationalist group called the RSS, which is the kind of mothership of of, of the ideology of Hindu nationalism, and also uh, which gave birth to the BJP, which is a ruling party. But this guy was a, just a grassroots worker. He was just one of you know tens of thousands of guys. And he slowly worked his way up the party, became chief minister of Gujarat at the end of 2001, had, had a controversial tenure, tenure as chief minister of Gujarat between 2001 and 2014, and then wrested control of the party from another man called L.K. Advani, who dominated the party for uh, almost 50 years at that point. He wrested control of the, of the political party and then propelled himself to the prime ministership and is now the most powerful prime minister India has seen, uh, at least since Indira Gandhi, who was in you know the nineteen seventies and nineteen eighties. So, like a re- you know a remarkable figure by uh, by by any stretch. If you were to assess his assess his record so far, I would say that in uh, in economic terms, it's been all right. It's not been. I don't think it deserves the hype. About ten years ago, India's per capita income was, you know, maybe what it was about fourteen hundred. Now it's about twenty eight hundred. So it's doubled, but it's doubled in ten years off a very, very low base. Uh, he has had. He's he has not. He has put in place some economic reforms, but very often uh, he has been thwarted by politics. So, for example, a couple of years ago, he tried to liberalize India's agriculture, which is really key to the country's uh, economy. Because a very, very large proportion of Indians, almost 45%, live off the land, which is, again, quite different from, dramatically different from China, where it's only about 20%, and exp- um, and even more dramatically different from the U.S., where it's about 2%, right? So, it's like, so he tried to liberalize it, bring in market forces in agriculture, was thwarted, pushed back, tried to liber- liberalize labor laws. It's very hard to hire and fire people in India was not particularly successful but he's done some things he privatized air india which I, which you know i always joke is the world's uh, worst airline except perhaps pakistan international airways it's a cl- close competition between india and pakistan there <laughs> um he's managed to privatize it so he's done something he's built a lot of uh, infrastructure startups have boomed so economically you know you could say that he's been he's been reasonable he hasn't been terrible he hasn't been great from a us perspective he's actually been quite good in many ways because um, he has taken a firm line on on china and he has been willing to deepen the military relationship with the us with much less hesitation than his predecessors and so in that sense you can so you know you see india's orientation India had, you know, since the end of the Cold War, it had begun to tilt more towards the U.S., but that process has certainly been accelerated under Modi. So that's 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 been um, that's that's been good from a U.S. perspective, and I would argue from an Indian perspective also. The most worrying part is the state of uh, you know Indian democracy or liberal democracy, and the most worrying part within that is how India views. Uh, it's religious minorities. So like very quickly, this is a country where you know, it was more than 1.4 billion people. Uh, roughly 80% of Indians are Hindu. The other tw- off, the, off the other 20%, roughly 15, 15, roughly 15% of Indians are Muslims. 
and the remainder are Christian Sikhs and other uh, religious minorities. Right. So technically, it's the biggest Muslim country in the world, too, right? Indonesia is bigger. And I think now for the longest time, Indonesia was the most populous and then India was second. Uh -huh. But I think now Pakistan has overtaken India. So it's number, okay. it's third. But in any case, it's a, it's a massive Muslim population. Big number. Yeah. Very big number. More than 200 million, uh, uh, 200 Muslim, most million Muslims. And the ideology to which uh, Mr. Modi subscribes has always had kind of trouble with Indian Muslims because Hindu nationalism in a nutshell views India as essentially a Hindu country where religious minorities, um, particularly uh, Christians and Muslims, but particularly Muslims within that, uh, are viewed with a certain degree of suspicion. Modi has uh, struggled with that. So I'll give you just one example, right? And I mean, uh, ever since independence, yeah, every Indian cabinet, as you would expect, you know, a country with a large Muslim population has had Muslim members in the cabinet. Uh, right now, the BJP has roughly 300 members of parliament in the lower house of uh, lower, lower lower house of parliament, the directly elected house. Uh, not even one Muslim, uh, not even one Muslim in the cabinet or council of ministers, and that's you know quite unprecedented. You've never seen anything like this in India before. And then at the state level, the uh, BJP governments have passed laws that, even though they're ostensibly they're 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 they're, they're neutral. But in reality, are used to target things about Muslims that upset them particularly. So, for example, they've passed these things called love, so-called love jihad laws, which are basically aimed at harassing or making it difficult for Muslim men to marry Hindu women. They've passed a bunch of uh, very draconian laws on 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 eating beef and cow and killing cows. Some of these were sort of, you know, they existed in the past, but they've been strengthened or the penalties have been made much harsher. And again, the general, you know, the, the philosophy behind that is that uh, the cow is sacred to pious Hindus and uh, Muslims by, you know, by being involved in the cattle trade are violating these religious sensibilities. We've had several high profile cases of uh, Muslims being lynched uh, in 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 various states, particularly in northern India, so a lot of that has been worrying. The state of media freedom has been quite worrying, where you know the uh, 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 it's kind of like the, you know the opposite of 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 the U.S., where right when Trump was elected, you had the Washington Post and the New York Times and everybody just you know going to like launch a you know a, a, this this righteous campaign to sort of uh, against uh, against him. In India, basically, the, the, the media, the vast majority of the media, including the television media, basically, you know, were, com were com instantly co-opted by Modi. And so, you know, they don't play the, w the role of a watchdog. They play much more the role of a lapdog. So, in, so in, if I were to sort of summarize, I'd say that Modi's done uh, okay in economics. He's done quite well in terms of foreign policy. But if you think that India ought to be a liberal democracy and that a country that's with such a large population and with such diversity can only be held f held together in the long term with some form of liberalism like it's not it's not realistic and india is not going to be denmark but is india aspiring toward being denmark or is it aspiring toward being something else uh, i think he'd get you know that there i'd say that there's there's genuine cause for concern and coming to the comparison, I'd say the closest comparison on the world stage is uh, Erdogan. Mm -hmm. And you can see very striking similarities. So, right, Erdogan grows up, grew up poor in a rough neighborhood, uh, was a bit of a local tough. Uh, again, Modi comes, you know, Modi as a child, stole, uh, he, uh, he sold tea at a railway station. Uh, no, no kind of privilege, even now. I mean, he speaks English. I've spoken with him in English, but it's 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 he doesn't speak it with any any degree of fluency and he prefers to speak uh in hindi if you speak hindi and if you're a gujarati speaker that's his native language he would prefer to speak in gujarati uh so he, he comes you know really from an from an underprivileged background both in terms of uh, class and also in terms of caste uh you know he belongs to a, a to a, a group of uh, a, a caste which is traditionally associated with uh oil pressing in in gujarat which is kind of it's so it's classified as uh, in, in, in indian context it's called a backward caste backward other backward class so he didn't have caste privilege he did not have class privilege um 
so very similar to Erdogan in that way. And then again, the another very big point of similarity is that you know the AKP is the political vehicle of the of the of Islamism in Turkey, and the BJP is the political vehicle of Hindu nationalism in India. Now, I'm not saying that Hindu nationalism and Islamism are identical. There, I mean, there are important differences. But essentially, you know, here is a it's a political movement that is rooted in this idea. Uh, of a uh, majority faith sh- that a majority faith should be dominant in a particular place and again has many many countless workers who've been working towards this for many many decades and again they have very similar enemies right so erdogan is you know famously opposed to the old istanbul elite the kamalists mm-hmm. uh the secularized westernized turks and those are pretty much modi's enemies too you know the, the sort of he, he he thinks of the people around the the congress party which is led by the heirs of jawaharlal nehru uh as these kind of you know effete westernized english speaking often liberal people who are the enemy and so that's where the parallels are the most striking there's one really one one very big difference though which is that because india is just so massive you have powerful state level politicians in india mm-hmm. and they govern states that are larger than most countries right right cuz they you know, as, 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 you could have 50 million people or 60 million people in a state and it could be ruled by by an opposition leader there's nothing there's nothing quite similar to that in turkey because the scale is much smaller so i would say uh, closest to erdogan but um, keep in mind that india is just much more unwieldy and much larger and much it's much harder for anybody to assert total control over the country okay so now i'm going to do a cleanup operation and ask a bunch of specific questions that i wanted to stop you while you were talking to ask but i figured i better let just let you run first of all when the the muslims not being in the cabinet i have to assume that's mostly the the blame for that is mostly on the modi side of it that said how, would joining a a Modi cabinet or a Modi government, uh, would that undermine your legitimacy as an authentic Muslim leader in India? I mean, is, 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 could it be chicken and egg in there, or is it just all just sort of a barrier entry thing? I mean, it would, but he, it, but I don't necessarily think that he needs to have the most, you know, authentic grassroots. Right, uh, Muslim leader there, but I just think that you know, and again, I'm not sort of, I'm not overly doctrinaire about this. I don't think it needs to necess- everything needs to necessarily be proportional or anything like that. But I just think that if you have a country and you know, if 15 percent of your population belongs to a particular faith, it's just kind of weird to not have anybody. And uh, the the BJP would respond and they say, well, you know, the, but and they do respond when I've asked them about this, and they say, well, well the, the Muslims never vote for us. In fact, they actively vote against us so then why so why why should we do anything for them and i just think that that's a that's a parched way of looking at politics i think you should have some kind of representation even if the muslims don't vote for you and even if they actively vote against you on this illiteracy issue i remember reading gosh it's probably 25 years ago now um but samuel samuel huntington had made the point that he's influence on me in, in a couple different ways but one of them was he stood opposed to the concept that that infects a lot of political thinking of what he called the unity of goodness, that all good things go together, when in fact sometimes good conditions rest on, on a bad thing and bad conditions are sort of epiphenomenal to a good thing. And the example, one of the examples he used back then was that one of the sources of stabil- relative stability in India was the mass illiteracy because it locked out vast numbers of people from engaging in politics, um, among other things, or of being able to articulate, uh, uh, you know, their interests in a coherent kind of way. It seems to me like, let me put it this way. I've been reading a lot about the Protestant Reformation and the sort of the rise in literacy combined with the rise in the, the advent of the printing press combined to create a new politics. Is there a sense in which sort of populism and nationalism is at least somewhat being driven by the convergence of the the rise in literacy and also the the role that social media can play to actually convey and transmit politics to people who are still not able to read, but you can get a lot from video and social media that you don't necessarily need to read. I mean, is there that kind of 
is the nationalism stuff being fueled in a way by this 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 technological change yeah um short answer yes absolutely for sure now I mean, what's what's interesting about the indian experiment is that india is the first country that adopted universal suffrage before it had universal literacy so it just took this it took it as a, as a uh, it became independent in 1947 and then by 1950 it had instituted it had adopted universal suffrage and so there was there, there was always political participation so that's one one thing that sets india apart the other thing that sets india apart or or that makes it different at least from the united states is that in india in general the richer you are the less likely you are to vote Hmm. And so the poor have always been uh been at least since the 1950s they've been uh they've had the vote and they've voted in very large numbers. Um but it is true and at the same time you know literacy rates have been rising decade by decade still high in absolute numbers but in I think percentage terms it would be maybe roughly around 20% of the country right now still very high but it it would have you know it would they, they it, it would have been more than half the country at independence. So like so literacy ha- rates have have risen. I think social media has made a very very big difference because what it ended up doing was it completely undermined old consensus on many issues including uh, interfaith relations. Mm-hmm. And it allowed a phenomenon like Modi uh like mo- like Modi to emerge. Now so far I think the you know fact that India has elections elections are generally fair uh, I think that has really helped and uh, keep things together and give people a kind of outlet uh, for these pressures every 5 years if you really get and then again at the state level if you if you're not if you're upset by what's going on the the general uh, the general rule is that you go in and you vote and you 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 get rid of your chief minister or you get rid of your prime minister and uh that has uh, served india well so i think it's been able to cope with the rising literacy and the democratization of communication through social media uh because it's had the outlet of elections back on the muslim thing for a second if i were to talk to not an enlightened you know cosmo- cosmopolitan like yourself but if i were to talk to mainstream but moderately you know uh a mainstream member of the bjp who wants to justify the the animosity or the the the, the biases against muslims What's the story that they tell? Is it is it a story that revolves around Pakistan? Is it a story that revolves around grievances going back five centuries? Is it is it is this an ancient thing or is it a new thing that has that is sort of grasping at uh, older stories to lend itself you know legitimacy? Um, like what what is the I'm not asking for you to just traffic an anti-Muslim bigotry here, mm-hmm. but like, what is the nature and justification for the biases against against Muslims as they would explain it? Yeah, so um, so it's absolutely based rooted in history, right? And and, and you sort of have to go back, and they're, they're they're basically if you go back a hundred years, they're basically you know three big ideas about Hindu-Muslim relations. This is in the last decades of British rule in India. Now the the one idea which is the idea of gandhi and nehru was that indians were all essentially one people and they happened to follow different faiths and the two dominant religions in india were obviously hinduism and islam and the idea was that you get rid of the the foreigners who were the british and all the indians are going to rule happily together and if there are any divisions those divisions have been caused you know by 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 the perfidious english and that Indians and uh, Hindus and Muslims were all going to be happy together. So that was the Congress view. The main view that arose in opposition to that was, in fact, the view of the party called the Muslim League, led by Muhammad Ali Jinnah, which led to the creation of Pakistan. And the Pakistani view was that, well, actually, wait a minute, that's not true. Uh, Hindus and Muslims are profoundly different. They have always been profoundly different, and uh, you know, Jinnah famously said that there are two nations in every village in India. I think this is called the two-nation theory, and that Muslims do not want to uh, live in an India that would be dominated by Hindus because demographically they were but they had they had greater weight, and therefore they demanded the creation and eventually got uh, a new country called Pakistan, which was carved out of the western and eastern portions that were Muslim majority. In 1947, right, and, and in 1971, one part of that becomes Bangladesh. So that's that's that's. But there was a third idea that didn't get much attention at the time, 
which was the idea of Hindu nationalism, which in many ways was similar. They may, they were making arguments that were kind of the mirror image of what the of what ba- people who wanted Pakistan were saying. So they were saying, well, you know, yes, we agree with you. Hindus and Muslims are not the same. Are not the same. They're profoundly different. But the Hindu nationalist view was that this was always a Hindu country, and for a thousand years, starting with the sort of first, you know, the, well, it goes back to the 700s, starting with the first Arab incursions in, in the 700s, and then it accelerates in about, you know, 300 years later when uh, Muslims establish uh, more of a, a, a beachhead in the Indian mainland, particularly in northern India. So they view Indian history as this long struggle. And Modi himself often uses the term, he uses the term 1200 years of slavery, or and that refers to you mean to get to twelve hundred years you have to go back to the very first um, Arab uh, incursions into what, what is now Pakistan and Sindh and Pakistan in seven eleven. Mm-hmm. So the way they view Indian history is that this was um, there was a golden period where this was a Hindu land, and then the Muslims arrived as marauders and invaders, and the Hindus heroically fought back and fought back and fought back, and then the Brits came, and now. Uh, so the, the the Hindus first got rid of the the, the Muslims, and then they got rid of the British, and now they and now they are in charge of their own country. And history is very very alive, uh, particularly among you know for 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 BJP uh, anyone sort of involved with the party. I mean, I remember once I was in a television studio and you know having a conversation about some, something you know an election or something that had happened the previous week with the with the with the BJP spokesperson and then suddenly he was like talking to me about something that happened in 1674 <laughs> and it was like it happened last Tuesday and it was just it was fascinating to me it's almost like there, there wasn't a separation right something that happened in 1526 and that something that happened last Tuesday are on the same plane and i think that's one thing about their worldview that is uh, quite striking and then the other i think is more common and you see this in many parts of the world which is that they don't really distinguish between uh, radical Muslims and ordinary Muslims. So I think your average uh, BJP supporter would say something like, look, there's this whole historical background, and this has been the, the struggle of our nation to be independent and to not be ruled by other people of an alien faith. And then they'll talk about the Pakistan movement, and they'll say that, well, look, there's this great injustice. The Muslims got their own country called Pakistan. Uh, and then, of course, you know, they'll sort of, they'll, they'll elide over any complexity in this, for example, the fact that, you know, yes, some Muslims wanted Pakistan, but then other Muslims were with Gandhi and Nehru in Congress, and they wanted independence. So they'll just sort of, they'll ignore that, that you know, stuff stuff like that. But that would be their, their basic argument. And then they would argue, and I think with some justification over here, that at least the, I mean, even I've argued this point, that the leadership of India's Muslim community has remained quite uh, reactionary, right? So if you look at the kinds of things that they are most concerned about, um, you know, it's things like, you know, we want more hijab in the classroom and uh, we want the right to pray on public streets. And a lot of regular, you know, Hindus who are not necessarily, you know, Hindu nationalists um, do find some of this upsetting. So I think that would that would be, so the, the Hindu nationalist story would be that, look, uh, liberals, are a little bit too generous to the Muslim community, and they ignore the real problems, uh, both historical and contemporary. Given the sort of omnibus indictment that you said the typical PJP member would make, I thought it was interesting you didn't say, which I would just sort of assume, like that, I'm not saying it's true, I'm just saying that I would assume that the argument would be made that given tensions with Pakistan, that, that, there's an idea that they would be kind of a fifth column. You know, you hear this every now and then about Arab Israelis that, you know, they're, um, you know, the dual loyalty kind of claim. You hear about it, Jews in the United States, the dual loyalty. No, but that's, that, right? that's true. Um, I, um, but that's, that's foundational, and it goes back to even before the creation of Pakistan. So the main Hindu nationalist ideologue was a man called uh, Savarkar, and Savarkar sort of, the, the, what what differentiated him from the kind of mainstream Indian nationalism of Gandhi and Nehru, right? The, their, their, their nationalism was more Western in that sense, right? It doesn't matter what religion you are, you just happen to be in, you're, you're Indian, and it doesn't matter if you happen to be Muslim or happen to be Christian or Sikh or whatever. Um, Savarkar distinguished between what he you know saw as called uh, Indic faiths and 
uh, Abrahamic faiths. And in his view, only those people who viewed India as both the Holy Land and the Fatherland uh, were truly Indian. And by that, he meant Hindus, Sikhs, Buddhists, because these are all faiths that were born on the Indian subcontinent. And he distinguished between those three groups and particularly uh, Muslims and Christians. And the idea being, and he's written this explicitly, uh, his, that, that because the Muslims pray towards Mecca and the Christians uh, look towards Rome or Jerusalem, they are can't really fully be trusted. So the idea of, of, of viewing religious minorities as a kind of fifth column by default uh, is kind of baked in the cake with Hindu nationalism. Uh, obviously, the creation of Pakistan and the fact that India has very poor relations with Pakistan exacerbates that on a day-to-day -day basis. All right. Now I'll ask you some difficult questions. I'm a bit of a hobbyist when it comes to the issue of nationalism generally, and uh, because nas nationalism is actually uh, fairly modern at least in, in the West, a fairly mo modern concept. And one of the things that tends to create the modern nation states starting in the you know, late 1700s, early 1800s, essentially foreign occupation. Uh, the French Napoleonic and before that revolutionary troops arouse a spirit of Germanness because they're, you know, when they're occupied by French forces, um, the a lot of the anti-Catholic stuff with the rise of Luther of Protestantism feels like, you know, this foreign Latin thing is being imposed upon us. And there's an argument, um, which I take no part in because I just don't know enough, feel comfortable about, but at least I find the arguments on both sides interesting and persuasive to one extent or another, that India wouldn't be India, wouldn't be a nation um, coherent and, and unified to the extent that it is, but for um, British imperialism, that the sense of national identity uh, created by British imperialism is what made India. And if India had not been occupied and, and you know, and, and to whatever extent colonized by, by the Brits, it would have ended up being, I don't know, five, six different nation states. Is, is, is that, if I stepped on some sort of third rail by asking the question about like, how much of Indian sense of national identity predates, uh, you know, the, the Raj and, and all that? Where do you come down on, on this question? Now, again, this will depend on who you ask, right? Now, the, you know, the, the Hindu nationalist view would be that there was always some kind of deep Hindu consciousness that was, uh, you know, revealed in f fighting against uh, Islamic conquerors, and then in the Marathas of the of, of Western India, who you know who and, and who fought the British and so on. My own view is that the British played a very large role in Indian political consciousness in several ways. Um, I think the most important is that they actually unified the whole subcontinent, right? They and, and it had been. It's not as though there, there 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 had been powerful rulers over the centuries who had, at different periods, held sway over much of what is today's India and and today's Pakistan. But nothing to the extent of what the British did in terms of both in terms of uh, in terms of territory, but also in terms of uh, organization and language. Right? I mean, they created a lingua franca to one extent. They created a lingua franca, and from the end of the nineteenth century, they introduced Western education, and that created a Western educated elite. So the Congress Party in eighteen eighty five. Right? These are these are all people who are you know educated at at uh, either university educated. They all they sp they speak English. Uh, and so uh, the, I think the, the, the Brits definitely uh, do get some credit. Now, do I, would nationalism have, would, would some kind of nationalism have emerged even without colonialism? I mean, it's hard to say, right? I mean, look at the parts of the world that are, that were not colonized and you still, I mean, like Thailand is a great example, right? There is something called Thai nationalism. So I don't know if, you know, nationalism is, you know, it's, it's just one of those, I don't know if that's one of those global trends that would have, made its way to India in some way regardless. But I think, you know, in terms of history, there's no doubt that uh, the British played a, a, a large role in this. And I don't think that we would, I mean, quite apart from partition, right, uh, it's not clear that this would, you know, the, the, the map would look the way it looks now if the British had not been there.
And then last, before we get into the international relations stuff, um, cast. Now, I have Indian American friends, relatives, and it is one of these things that when I try to ask sort of well-intentioned, trying not to be offensive kind of questions, I get people, you know, it's sort of like the old joke about uh, how do you get an Episcopalian to look at his shoes, talk about money? Uh, (laughs) Way to get like sort of Indian Americans to look at their shoes and like be uncomfortable is to ask questions about caste of like whether it still exists, how strong it is. And so I'm just going to ask it like that. Like, like maybe, maybe even if you could just sort of explain why it is that I get that impression. Am I, you think I'm wrong about this? Um, but it feels like this is something that is a, don't talk about it with outsiders thing. So I think you, you probably get that for a couple of reasons. I think one is that, you know, this is something that uh, I guess some Indians feel sensitive about because it's, you know, they, they may view it as this is something that's used as a cudgel against India or Indian society. I think you have sort of some one group of people. But I think the dominant reason is that most people, most Indian Americans certainly, don't know anything about it. Many Indians don't know that much about it either. So like if you were, if I were to kind of paint a picture of how I think most Americans think of it, um, they think of this, you know, this uh, hierarchical structure and you've got, you know, these uh, Brahmins on the top and then you've got all these other people, you know, toiling at the bottom. And I think what people don't recognize is there there are two components to this, and I'll try to explain this as lucidly as I can. But there is, first of all, there's the there's a fourfold hierarchical structure, which most people are familiar with, or many people are familiar with in some ways, right? With the Brahmins, who are the priestly class on top, right below this are the Kshatriyas, who are the warriors and kings. Right below that are the Vaishyas, who are the merchants and businessmen. And below that are the Shudras, who are the peasants. Right, that's the hierarchical structure of traditional Hinduism, and outside of those four, you have the what used to be called the untouchables, now known as the Dalits. Right, so that's the traditional. It's it's a the fourfold or fivefold system, but caste as it operates uh, doesn't really operate at the level that's called varna. It doesn't operate at the level of varna at all. Um, the way it operates, or the way it's traditionally operated in India, is at the level of uh, of of uh, of something called a word called jati. So, which is that you've got the four, but you have more functionally. You have more than three thousand castes in India, and more than twenty five thousand subcastes. So, and the way this manifests itself, or it's manifested itself most uh, traditionally, has been on in marriage. So. It's not as though traditionally, if you just said, you know, well, okay, Brahmins are marrying Brahmins, it was like, if you're a particular type of Brahmin, let's just say you're a Tamil Ayer, okay? That's a very particular type of Brahmin in Tamil Nadu in the deep south of India. You would traditionally be expected to marry another Tamil Ayer. Those are the endogamous groups. So think of this, right? So think of 25,000 little endogamous groups. That's the operative in in terms of, you know, that that's how caste has traditionally functioned. Now, the other element in caste, which was that traditionally caste was tied to occupation, right? So if you were, you know, the, 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 the son of a priest became a priest, the son of a farmer became a farmer, and so on. And so those are the sort of the two elements, the fact that there was this, there was this, ritual hierarchy and then you had professions which were bound to birth those are the two sort of the you know dominant features of the of the of the of of the system now in modern india the, to what degree does that uh, exist and the, to, I, I think it's been it's broken down quite dramatically i don't think it's disappeared right if you like if you open a newspaper you still find people sort of saying you know for whatever cost you know, that they want to marry someone, they're looking for a bride or a groom within that same subcast. That's still very common, but it's broken down in very important ways. The first is that you can't identify a person by caste always and easily. It's not like race in that sense. So, for example, uh, if you can tell that certain names are most definitely Brahmin, mm-hmm. 
but then there are many, many names that could be anything. You can't tell by skin tone, though you may say that, uh, that, you know, if you were to take, like, say, I'm being quite crude over here, but let's just say as a you know thought experiment, if you were to put a thousand Brahmins from the northern state of Uttar Pradesh in a room, and then you were to take a thousand people at random, probably the thousand Brahmins would on average um, be lighter skinned than the thousand on. But within that, you'd find very dramatic variation, right? So you, you can't really use, you can't, I mean, the, so the, the, the being able to tell it's uh, not that straightforward. Like it depends on, you know, how much you know. And then it's just a question of a lot of this is just local knowledge, right? So someone in Bengal would know that, okay, this particular Bengali name is associated with this caste, but someone in Maharashtra may not have a clue about, you know, which Bengali names are from, are associated with which caste. I mean, finish that thought if you want, but also like, where in Indian life, either geographically or socially or economically or legally, um, where in Indian life is caste still very relevant, other than uh, dating, right? Other than matchmaking kind of thing. Like, is it in, in employment? Is it in civil rights? Is it in pop culture or in a it- couple of different places right and i think the most most uh most dramatic are politics and the um, indian programs of affirmative action so in politics you know uh, uh, essentially people like political parties even political parties that you know ostensibly you know claim not to care too much about this when you are nominating someone to run for a seat in parliament political parties look very carefully and they see what's the cost uh, makeup of that particular constituency. So if a particular constituency is, say, you know, dominated by Dalits, you know, you're going to probably run a Dalit candidate. But you also have a system in India called uh, reservations, which is the Indian form of um, affirmative action, which is basically it's, it's caste quotas. So what you have is about a fifth of the seats in parliament are 22.5 seats of per- 0.5% of the seats in parliament are reserved for either Dalits or tribals. So that means you, you're you not, other can, candidates who do not belong to one of those two groups are not allowed to run, right? So those are, those are so, so you end up with a certain percentage of the parliament. They're, everyone in the in that constituency would vote for the person, but those are, they're, 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 called, they're called reserved seats. And in government employment and in higher education, you now have quotas that, uh, you know, are basically about half of the 50%. So when you apply to, say, college in India, right, and, and you would you'd fill out a form, and let's say there are uh, 100 slots available in, med- in, in, uh, in a medical school, uh, 50 would, you know, everybody would just be competing write this exam and they would all be all, all compete and then 50 percent of those seats would be reserved so you'd have to you know so so again um 15 percent for the dalit 7.5 percent for tribals and then there's this other big swath which is poorly defined but let's just say it's that it's a sandwich of the people who are above the the in in the cost hierarchy above the dalits but below the three top tiers of the of the cost, below the Brahmins, Kshatriyas, and Vaishyas, that broad swath of the population, um, they're called other backward classes. And so, twenty seven point five percent of the seats of in a say in a, in a in a federally funded medical school would be reserved for them. And then again, it varies from state to state. So, like in Gujarat, which has a lot of tribals, the tribal the the reservation for tribals would be higher than for Dalits, but it's just a fact of life in India, both in terms of politics and in terms of government administration, government jobs, that uh, it's, it's, it's very salient. Where it is least salient is in the private sector, where there aren't privates, they're, they're, they don't have quotas in the private sector, they don't have quotas in the army. And, you know, lower cost activists would point to those you know, those sectors of Indian society and point out that they are overwhelmingly dominated 
by people who would traditionally be regarded as upper caste to point to injustice. And so, you know, this is a, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a very fraught debate, but uh, in terms of, you know, I'd say that where this, you know, it's, it's one of those ironies, right? Because the idea, I think, uh, you know, 80 years ago or a hundred years ago was that the idea was to get away from caste. But then I think by once you institute, you know, government programs and quotas, uh, it becomes salient. And now you have this, not now, but for several decades now, you've had this very interesting phenomenon of various groups agitating to be classified as uh, from an underprivileged caste. So it's not as though they're, you know, they're not agitating to be, no one is agitating to be classified as a Brahmin. They're agitating to be classified as an other backward caste because, you know, you could belong to, a, say, you know, a peasant, a, a, a traditional a peasant cultivator caste, and you could have, you know, in your village, there could have been two of these costs next to each other broadly at the same socioeconomic level, one gets included in this government list and suddenly access to education and access to powerful government jobs, you know, they get, they, and then that one, one of those two communities goes, be, becomes much more powerful. And then you have the other community that in an earlier era may have been trying to to move up the cost ladder or to, you know, sort of, you know, now trying to say that, no, well, actually, no, we're not, we're, we're you know, right. you have to, we're, we're also backward because, uh, because of the reserve, because of the reservations associated with it. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a weird thing, right? So like, I understand, you know, to where you started with, right? It's, if you're a sort of, you know, educated cosmopolitan, you don't really talk about it or think about it too much. And it's an impolite question. Like it'd be, a, it'd be a very rude question, right? To ask someone, "Hey, what is your cost?" And I think among Indian Americans in particular, I, I really don't think they, because you know, it's so bewilderingly complex. But in India itself, you know, it it it's it's a it's a big deal. It's not a, it's not a coincidence that you know Modi belongs to an other backward class himself, and that part of Modi's success is that he was able to take the BJP, which had traditionally been seen as a party of the upper caste. It was seen as a party of the Brahmins and the Banyas. And he was able to keep their upper caste voters and then dramatically expand the base to this large swath known as the other backward classes. But let me just give you, you know, one last thing on this because I realize this is a little bit confusing. If you just look at the, you know, if you look at the 80% of India that is Hindu, if you wrote, the, the numbers are, you know, broadly speaking, I'm, 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 I'm we haven't had a census since 1931 on this, by the way. <laughs> the, the the Brits had a census in 1931, and then there was a census in 2011, but they didn't release it because this is all politically explosive. But, you know, I think the best academic, you know, and, and, and other surveys on this suggest that roughly, you know, 16 to 18% of Indians would be some kind of upper caste, which would be those, you know, the Brahmins, the Kshatriyas, and the Vaishyas. And roughly around the same number, roughly about 16% would be the Dalits. In between is this are these other backward classes, which would traditionally have been the four, mostly the fourth tier in the caste system, and that's where it becomes interesting because there are powerful arguments where you could say that well, they deserve they the way they argue they deserve reservations because they're not represented proportionally at you know in in at at the at the highest levels in government or have not been traditionally. But on the other hand, these are, uh, many of them are very powerful groups because these are land-owning groups that dominate local politics. So politics, you know, the, the, the most powerful position after the prime minister in India is traditionally the chief minister of a state, which is the equivalent of a governor. And if you go back to 1947, when India became independent, many of these chief ministers uh, were Brahmins because they'd had a leg up, they'd had got to Western education first, they were in, in important positions in the Congress party. Nehru, the first prime minister himself, was a Brahmin. Uh, but if you look around the landscape now of India, the majority would be what you would call OBC in some way, because that's, that's just how democracy works. They have the numbers, and very often, you know, they're the most dominant groups. So then the question really is that if you're a dominant group, and you have political power, and you have numbers, and you have land, should you still get a leg up to go to medical school? And it's a big, it's a very fraught debate. And obviously, you know, as, as you could imagine, predictably, a lot of this kind of breaks down to into people who are born into an upper class, you know, arguing that this form of reservation is immoral and inefficient. 
and uh, people who were who are beneficiaries of it arguing that well you need that because uh, it need, you need to uh, right historical wrongs and so on. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to get off this because I know I'm, I'm I'm now officially abusing your time, but um, the way you describe it, I could imagine historically one of the big drivers of populism, nationalism, like in the 20th century in places like Italy, um, places like the United States, is you get the sort of, you know, economically it was often called producerism, right? It was this idea that the government, that the elites take care of themselves and that the government cares too much about the little person and the forgotten man who's like this sort of bastion of lower middle class traditional values kind of gets lost in the switches. I mean, I'm, I'm boulderizing and simplifying it profoundly, but that's a big part of like where the sort of the, a lot of the passion of, of the Trump coalition is, is these people who can't get over that they were called deplorables, you know, that they're the sort of standard forgotten white worker kind of crowd who aren't poor enough or a minority enough to like qualify for benefits of some kind as, as, as a victim status kind of thing, but also not established enough or elite enough to like just sort of coast on, on inheritance and whatnot. And that sort of middle class, you know, resentment in lots of places is, is the sort of feedstock for sort of national sentiment. And I'm just wondering if that's part of what the BJP appeal is, or am I just, in pure occidental fashion imposing western concepts on a country where it no, just it absolutely really apply. does apply i think but i think the bjp has used this very intelligently they've, they've they've tapped into different kinds of resentments so you kind of have the resentment of the you know formerly dominant um upper caste uh, you can imagine someone living in a small town somewhere in uttar pradesh and they couldn't get into uh, engineering school because if they're you know they're reserv- they're because if they they did they didn't have enough good enough grades and they're only only half of the of the places that were available and there'd be that kind of resentment and then you'd have the resentment of you know people more broadly towards what they see as the kind of out of touch English speaking westernized elite uh, and what the BJP did was that it's it's managed to channel these different kind of streams of resentment. And uh, direct a lot of it toward what they portray as the pampering or mollycoddling of the Muslim minority. And again, there's some truth to the BJP argument, in fairness, that, you know, what, what happened over the decades is that, you know, Indian secularism, which was, you know, meant to treat, you know, all people equally, ended up pandering to the most uh, regressive and conservative elements in the Muslim community. So, for example, Indian Muslim uh, men are allowed to have four wives. And that is something that really kind of rankles with this, and you know, you're that average person. And so the BJP was able to kind of tap into a lot of these resentments. And quite remarkably, though, and they could only do this because of, you know, the sort of Modi himself, like that, that they were able to transcend or they've been able so far to transcend caste divisions and essentially unite a large chunk of that 80% of the country that is Hindu and, and, and get them into a broad coalition, which, you know, a few decades ago, people would have argued was almost unthinkable because the salient fact in Indian politics was not the division between Hindus and Muslims. It was the divisions within Hindu society along caste lines. All right, so very quickly, I, I promise I'll do this rapid fire, but just a few things. One, you know, I've, my my dear friend Ramesh Paneru, he always sort of jokingly talks about what a great country America is, that his parents came here with nothing but their medical degrees <laughs> and made a good life for themselves. <laughs> and, and I'm wondering, like, uh, the impression that a lot of native-born Americans get about the Indian, about Indian immigrants, Indian Americans, Indian diaspora is that, you know, I've made jokes for years about Amer- you know, the N- Indian Americans are the new Jews. You over-educate your kids, you bury them in guilt, um, and you have these incredibly high expectations for them. And um, and I'm wondering, like, for, well, first of all, what do, what, what do they think about the Indian diaspora in India um, in the sense of, you know, like, China has very strong views about what the Chinese diaspora is supposed to be up to. 
Um, uh, but secondly, where do you think the impression of what India is like is misleading by the Indians that Americans actually get to interact with? Well, I think it's hugely misleading. Uh, you know, the famous story is that 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 uh, George W. Bush, uh, you know, who led this big opening to India, and then they led to this nuclear deal between the U.S. and and and, and India, and and the whole the reason that the, as the story goes, the reason he you know got interested in India was that he saw that there were so many Indian doctors in Texas, and he was just like, you know, who are these people, and they're doing so well. To answer the first part of your question. Um, the, Indians uh, in India are, you know, they pay a lot of attention to the di- diaspora. They're extremely proud of the diaspora. Uh, you know, Sundar Pichai of Goo. I assume remittances are a big deal, right? I mean, they it's have- a huge big deal. So you, you know, so people like you know yeah. Sundar Pichai of Google or Satya Nadella of of uh, Microsoft or Indra Nooyi who used to head Pepsi. These are all like you know pe- people know of these people. They're celebrities in India. And, uh, you know, Indians are, you know, they're, they are very, very proud of the success of the Indian American community, the fact that it's wealthy and well-educated and so on. But you have to see that there's a very, you know, it's, it's about 4.4 million strong. It's a, it's, a, it's a very small slice of, I would argue, the most educated and driven Indians, by and large, I mean, there has been some, you know, uh, there has been um, blue collar immigration also. But what basically happened was, you know, if you had to compress this really fast, is that in, in, in 1947, India becomes independent, and it embarks upon this, you know, disastrous uh, project called Nehruvian socialism, where they basically try to, you know, borrow uh, the idea of economic planning from the Soviet Union. But at the same time, you have a cohort of educated people, and some of them have educated because they've had, India has had Western education since the last half of the 19th century under the British. And then the new government in India invests in uh, engineering colleges and stuff. And the Indian focus is unlike unlike many Southeast Asian countries. India focused on uh, r- creating relatively good tertiary education instead of focusing more on primary education. So you by the mid 1960s when the you know U.S starts opening up to immigration there's you've got the uh you've got this supply of people who are educated and they can't find jobs in their own country because their own economy is shambolic and then you have the u.s and not just the u.s canada and other countries in the west that are opening up to non-white people and that accelerates but as a result what you have in 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 the u.s is it's it's a microcosm that in many ways is not really representative of of India per se. Um, I don't think you heard me before when I said the big deal. I wasn't just talking about the famous rich people. I said I assume remittances are a remittances big deal. are a big deal, but more, more interestingly, not from the part of the diaspora that is celebrated by the Indian media. The Indian media celebrates the wealthy, successful, and high-profile Indians in the U.S., in Canada, in the U.K., and so on. But the bulk of the remittances comes from, you know, people in the Middle East, people who are working, you know, just working as as laborers or working on construction sites in Qatar and Saudi Arabia and across across the Gulf. Uh, so in, in some ways, the, the remittance story, remittances matter, but, you know, you're talking, it's it's a it's a very large economy at this point, so it's not a it's not a remittance depend, dependent economy in the sense you know in the way for example the, the the Philippines is, and the remittances come from the part of the diaspora that Indians don't talk about as much because maybe it doesn't feel them make them feel as good about themselves, which is the fact that this is remains a very poor country, and you have many people who are working under not always great conditions who are nonetheless drawn to places like, uh, you know, the UAE and Saudi Arabia and Qatar, because, you know, that's, that's the best way they can, you know, p- p- put food on their table and, and have and create and have enough money to educate their children. Right. I mean, the people who came to America came to start new lives. The people who go to UAE go to send remittance exactly. to get jobs that allow them to provide for their families. So you can see why it'd be disproportionate. All right. So uh, we didn't do any foreign policy stuff, just very quickly. Who does India care worry more about, China or Pakistan, and why? China for sure. 
uh, if you talk to sort of, you know, if you were to poll 100 Indian strategic thinkers, the overwhelming majority would say that China is the biggest threat. Um, and the reasons are, you know, the, the reason is pretty obvious, uh, which is that it, Pakistan is seen more as, uh, as a nuisance, uh, whereas China is seen as a genuine threat. And if I had to kind of, you know, quickly summarize, you know, you have these, uh, they, they have a 2200 mile uh, unsettled boundary. And this is a big deal because China has, in fact, settled its land boundaries with uh, all, all its neighbors. The only land boundary that is not settled is India, or if you count Bhutan, but that's just really, that's really tiny. It's almost like a rounding error. So they, the, the China-India boundary remains unsettled. There has been violence there. In 2020, there was a, you know, armed clashes where the two sides attacked each other in this, you know, rather medieval manner. They attacked each other with, you know, clubs, with barbed wire and stuff. Uh, more, uh, about 20 Indian soldiers died. And officially, the Chinese say only four Chinese died. Unofficially, they say the numbers are much larger. You have tens of thousands of troops in the Himalayas, face eye, eyeball to eyeball. They've had 21 rounds of talks since 2020. They haven't come to any agreement. And so, at the, you know, when the Indians look around, they see that China is the only other country which has as many people, roughly as many people, both of these uh, 1.4 billion people each. China has done much better than India economically and technologically. It's about, you know, uh, per capita income is about four and a half times uh, higher in China, even though as recently as 1990, they were roughly at the same level in terms of per capita income. Uh, and so the Indians really feel Chinese influence growing, not only within India, but along India's periphery. Uh, places like Sri Lanka, Nepal, the Maldives, uh, countries which, you know, the Indians traditionally saw as their, you know, quote unquote, near abroad. Uh, you now have uh, the Chinese influence growing uh, very rapidly. And so the Indians are uh, extremely concerned about about China. And what the Chinese have done with India is quite similar to what they've done with, you know, Southeast Asian countries or in the South China Sea, where they basically create facts on the ground. So in the South China Sea, they do it by, you know, they'll create an artificial uh, island and then they'll say, well, and then they'll put some soldiers there and they'll say, well, then now, now we're just here. Um, and they've done something similar where they have essentially nibbled along um, uh, uh, and, and put, put troops in areas that both countries claim, laid claim to, and the Chinese are just trying to, by force, change the change the change the boundary, change the border between the two countries. So the Indians are um, very concerned about China, and uh, they have not been able to come to any kind of agreement. And I think it's difficult for the two countries to come to an agreement because they're both, in many ways, I mean, they're obviously very different in in profound ways. But in one way that in which they're similar is that they're. Uh, both in this profoundly nationalistic phase. And um, for the Indian government, and particularly for the Hindu nationalists, which, you know, who tend to view India's geography as a kind of sacred geography, it's very difficult to, you know, sit across a table and say that, well, here you can have 10,000 square kilometers there, and why don't you give us 10,000 over here, and let's come to it, come, you know, let's just come, let, let's make a deal. They haven't been able to come to a, any kind of agreement. They've been at it since the 1950s. And uh, now the Indians see that the Chinese are trying to take by force what they haven't been able to get at the negotiation table. Okay, last question. I mean, I, I want to ask you about Israel stuff and all sorts of things in, in Ukraine. But uh, where do you see U.S.-India relations going in the next five to ten years? Sort of the, not necessarily the immediate term, but past the next election or two. So I think the bilateral relationship is going to be strong and it's going to remain strong because of, you know, it's China. That's basically it. And I think that the U.S. is, you know, in the end, willing to overlook a lot of things about India's trajectory that make it uncomfortable. So, for example, the erosion of liberal democracy, for example, the fact that India will you know is not uh, will continue to remain have close ties with uh, russia uh, it hasn't condemned the invasion of ukraine for instance but you know the from from a u.s perspective india is i, th I think people sometimes may you know they, they may exaggerate the extent to which india you know by itself is a counterweight to china i think india is far weaker than china but it does have a couple of important assets right it has geography it has population and more importantly it has a kind of self-image that makes it 
much more likely to stand up than roll over, which and the same can't be said for many of the Southeast Asian countries. And I think the other thing that's you know been you know broadly positive from the U.S. perspective is that it's not just that India has been growing closer to the U.S. India has also been growing closer to U.S. allies, and that's where the Israel question that you didn't ask comes in. Where uh, one thing where I think that you know Modi has done very well on is that he has uh, you know the, the India and Israel only established diplomatic relations in 1992, which I believe is also the same year that Israel uh, established relations with China, right? So it's suddenly like in one year, it established diplomatic relations with 36% of the world's population. But the India-Israel relationship, which was, it's been strong for a long time, but it was always kind of like a, you know, secret love affair. Um, I remember many years ago when I was a reporter and I went to the Israeli embassy in New Delhi and I wanted to talk to them about defense cooperation. And this very skillful Israeli diplomat only wanted to talk to me about drip irrigation. And no matter how many times I asked about, you know, <laughs> tanks and, and radars, the only thing I ever got, got in return was, look, we're growing, we're helping Indians grow these oranges with this great <laughs> <laughs> hydroponic tomatoes <laughs> going to save the world. <laughs> but, but it was, you know, but it was always kind of, it was a, it was, there was a lot of cooperation, but it was subterranean. And what Modi has done is that he has brought the India-Israel relationship into the open. And uh, I think that's, that's healthy and that's great. And um, there's a lot of genuine, very deep um, support for Israel in India, particularly among BJP supporters. But I would, you know, and so one, I, I, in fact, I wrote a column about this a, a few months ago where, you know, there was this, this idea that the whole so-called global south, I hate the term, but people use it. Uh, is all kind of unified against Israel and, you know, firmly in the camp of the Palestinians. Whereas in India, in fact, you have a great deal of support for Israel, a great deal of uh, sympathy for what the Israelis uh, went through on October 7th, uh, and really, you know, a hope that Hamas gets hammered. And so it's, you know, things are not, I mean, obviously you do have, you know, the traditional left that is reflexively pro-Palestinian, and unfortunately, a large section of India's Muslim leadership uh, has been, uh, again, very re- reflexively anti-Israel. But one thing that Modi has done, to his credit, is that he's taken the India-Israel relationship, which was strong but under wraps, and he's brought it out of the closet. He went to Israel. He was the first Indian prime minister to visit Israel. You know, he posed for well, he's on the on the beach with Netanyahu. They took selfies together. They wish each other on X publicly and, and uh, wish each other happy birthday. And so it's just, you know, it's, it's become a much more normal relationship. And uh, I think that is certainly to, uh, to Modi's credit. Okay, I obviously can go on for a while, uh, but we, uh, listeners may not, hopefully listeners won't know, but you actually lost the battery on your phone while you were talking to me. Um, so we should probably count our blessings. Sanan Dume, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jenna. All right, so Sanan has, has left the studio, and um, I hope people found this as interesting as I did. I probably should have um, talked to uh, Kevin Williamson a little bit about questions to ask since he's something of a student about India and whatnot, but I figured I'm just curious and I'll just ask questions. And, um, I am sure I didn't get to some questions that people wanted me to ask, but I thought just letting him explain stuff was really, really interesting to me. And that's my rule on here is if I think it's interesting, that's the standard. And, um, I do think it's sort of, I wish I could have talk to him a bit about it, about, um, it seems to me that there is a sort of natural kinship between Israel and India insofar as, or at least between the BJP sort of ideology of sort of sacred geography, you know, uh, religious sort of mission kind of thing, um, which can be overstated. I think a lot of people who don't like Israel overstated about Israel and don't overstate it at all about any other country. Um, they somehow think it's fine for all the other countries of the world to have a, an authentic religious flavor, but Israel isn't supposed to have one for, for reasons. Um, but we can talk about that another time. I will have responses to some of the feedback from the solo podcast once you know, people finish it because it was so freaking long. Thanks again to Sadatan and thank you and I'll see you next time. No, this podcast. Hai.